Mr. Speaker, today our thoughts are with the families of steel and aluminum workers in Ontario, Quebec, and Saskatchewan. The Prime Minister went to these communities on a victory tour. He personally promised these families that he had fixed the issue. He walked into those communities as a savior. Today, the Prime Minister is a failure. What is his plan to fix this tariff issue? Order. 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 Allah. Order. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville must not be shouting. Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, my colleague across the way should know better. This is not the time to be partisan. This is about Canadian workers. Speaker, we have been unequivocal. These tariffs are completely unacceptable. The Canadian and American economies are so closely linked that these tariffs will harm workers on both sides of the border. We will defend our steel and aluminum industry as well as Canadian workers. We will impose trade restriction measures of up to $16.6 billion worth of U.S. imports. The U.S. tariffs are in The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives aren't partisan when we're fighting for Canadian interests, Mr. Speaker. Families impacted by this decision, they don't want more platitudes from the Liberals. They want a plan. The Prime Minister has known for months that this was coming. He did nothing. The Conservative Party has been working with the government. We are Team Canada, but Team Canada needs a plan. What is the government's plan to fix this tariff issue? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, Canadian steel and aluminum workers have our full support. These tariffs are completely unacceptable. In response, we intend to impose tariffs against imports of steel, aluminum, and other products from the U.S. This means we are imposing dollar-for-dollar dollar tariffs for every dollar levied against Canadians by the U.S. As the Prime Minister told steel and aluminum workers when he visited their manufacturing plants across the country, this government will always stand up for them. The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, focusing on non-trade issues at the NAFTA table, no U.S. trade contingency plan in the budget. And then the Prime Minister goes to the President's hometown to deliver a speech that many viewed as a critique of the President. So far, the Prime Minister's plan has failed Canadians. Will the government agree to sit down with the Conservative Party and let's work together to help these workers? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, our government will always stand up for the Canadian steel industry and its workers. Today, we announced that Canada will impose up to $16.6 billion worth of tariffs on steel, aluminum, and other imports from the U.S. We are today beginning a 15-day consultation period with Canadians on these countermeasures. Our steel and aluminum workers need to know that we have their backs. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that the Liberal track record on trade relations with the United States is catastrophic. There has been no softwood lumber agreement. NAFTA negotiations have reached a dead end, and Liberal incompetence peaked this morning when the Prime Minister was incapable once again of standing up for the steel and aluminum industry. Mr. Speaker, 25% tariffs on steel, 10% on aluminum will mean how many jobs lost in Canada. What is their plan for workers? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, we have been absolutely clear. These tariffs are unacceptable. Our economies are closely linked and so closely linked that it will harm workers on both sides of the border. We will stand up for our industries and Canadian workers. We will impose trade restrictions to the tune of up to the tune of $16.6 billion on American employees. 
was. The American decision is counter to NAFTA and the WTO rules, and we will do everything in our power to challenge them. And we say to workers, you can count on your government. The honorable member for Megan Sikhlera. Well, we want more than words. Mr. Speaker, inside me, the prime minister personally told aluminum workers that American tariffs had been fixed. He said to the workers, the president has told me that there will be a trade agreement and there will no be, not be any tariffs. He believed the president. The naivety of this prime minister jeopardizes thousands of jobs and there is no plan for this industry. What will he do for the families? And we want more than words. What will we do for these workers who are so worried about their future? The Honorable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, my colleague should be ashamed of his partisanship. We will always stand up for our industries and Canadian workers. We will impose trade restrictions up to $16.6 billion on American imports. And we are beginning a 15-day consultation period today with Canadians on those countermeasures. Steel and aluminum workers can count on the support of this government. The Honourable Member for Bertie Maskinongi. Mr. Speaker, after months of paralyzing uncertainty, the American president decided to impose prohibitive tariffs on our aluminum and steel industries on grounds, the grounds that our exports threaten American national security. Thousands of jobs are at stake throughout Canada, and we've had enough of Donald Trump's threats. It is the workers who are going to suffer and who are stuck in this, in the crosshairs of this trade war. What will this government do to protect Canadian workers? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, we have been unequivocal. These tariffs are absolutely unacceptable. The American and Canadian industries are extricably linked together, inextricably linked together, and it affects both economies on both sides of the border. We will defend Canadian industry and Canadian workers. The American decision runs counter to NAFTA and WTO rules, and we will do everything in our power to challenge them. To the workers, we say you can and count on your government. Mr. Speaker, no one is surprised that President Trump imposed tariffs today. He's been tweeting about it for months. No one except for the Liberals. The Liberals watch this deadline day after day, week after week, and fail to secure an exemption for Canadian workers. Steel and aluminum workers are worried about how they're going to take care of their families. So will this government assure the tens of thousands of workers who are now caught in this trade war that their jobs are protected? The Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, Canadian steel and aluminum workers have our full support. These tariffs are completely unacceptable, and we've made that very clear. In response, we in intend to impose tariffs against imports of steel, aluminum, and other products from the U.S. This means we are imposing dollar-for-dollar -dollar tariffs for every dollar levied against Canada by the U.S. As the Prime Minister told steel and aluminum workers when he visited their manufacturing plants across the country, this government will always stand up for you. Honourable Member for Essex. Well, Mr. Speaker, if this is their full support, then workers in Canada are disappointed with their failure to get a full exemption. We all know the tariffs imposed by the White House today are a threatening tactic to get what they want out of NAFTA. The question all Canadians have for this government is why they couldn't secure a full exemption. Canada has been the Americans' closest friend, neighbour and ally, but now Canadian workers are under attack and they will pay the price for this failed Liberal leadership. What will this government do to actually protect workers and their jobs? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, our government will also always stand up for Canadian steel and aluminum workers, and we have made it very clear that the tariffs imposed by the United States today are completely unacceptable and have absolutely nothing to do with national security. So we've announced that Canada will impose up to $16.6 billion worth of tariffs on steel, aluminum and other products. And today we're beginning our consultation with Canadians with respect to uh, the measures that we are taking. Our steel and aluminum workers need to know that we will have their backs.
The Honourable Member for Jean Pierre. Mr. Speaker, well, it's clearly a failure what this government is doing. The tariffs announced by the United States on aluminum will affect thousands of workers in Saguenay Lac Saint Jean. They will also affect small businesses and all of the value added chain. I'd like to recall to the member that names of members cannot be used. I will begin again then, and I apologize. Apologize, rather. The tariffs announced by the United States on aluminum will affect thousands of workers in Saguenay Lac Saint Jean. They'll affect SMEs and all of the value added chain of this industry. While everyone is talking about trade wars and talking about tariffs, well, it's the workers who are going to stand the most to lose. So what will the government do to protect workers in our area and throughout the country? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, these tariffs are unacceptable. They will harm American workers and Canadian workers. The United, student, the United States have a surplus of trade with Canada. Canada is a secure and safe provider of steel and aluminum, aluminum for industries in the United States. And the idea that Canada could threaten national security in America is absurd. Canadian workers must know that our government will always stand up for them. Calgary, Signal Hill. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister invoked the name of Peter Lougheed in trying to justify his nationalization of the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Mr. Speaker, I worked with Peter Lougheed back in the 80s, and Peter Lougheed never nationalized a pipeline, never nationalized anything. In fact, Peter Lougheed defended Alberta's resources from this Prime Minister's father, who attempted to destroy the energy industry in Alberta. Will the Prime Minister stand up in this House and apologize? Something he's become very good at lately, Mr. Here, Speaker, here. in this House, and apologize for sullying the Premier's name, in, all in the vein of trying to justify nationalization here, of a pipeline. Here, here. Honourable Minister, order, order. Order. The Honourable Minister of Transport. All the Honourable Permanent Secretary of the Minister of Natural Resources, excuse me. Mr. Speaker. What we are doing is investing to pr protect thousands of jobs in Alberta and indeed across the country. During 10 years, the Conservatives' rigid ide ideology failed to build pipelines to markets other than those to the United States and failed Canadian workers. When the Prime Minister went to Fort McMurray and met energy sector workers, he told them that this government will have their back. This is an investment in hard-working Canadians. Conservatives might think it's too risky to bid, bid on Canadian workers, but we will always stand up for them. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, New Brunswick's Telegraph Journal says the Prime Minister doomed Energy East by moving goalposts and changing the rules at the last minute to, quote, make approval more difficult with an impossible and unrealistic standard, and that the Liberals are, quote, making Canada uncompetitive on the world stage and endangering the future of our energy sector. That's true. And the Prime Minister, he killed two other pipelines with uncertainty and red tape, too. When will the Prime Minister stop forcing investment out of Canada? Yeah, yeah. Honourable Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an absurd comparison in the two pipelines. Suggesting political interference was somehow the answer lies at the heart of the Conservative Party's failure on pipelines. It's shocking that the Conservatives can't tell the difference between a project that is facing political interference by a provincial government and a project that a company dropped because they simply saw no business case for it. The Trans Mountain Expansion Project is in Canada's na na national interest. It means thousands of good paying jobs that will strengthen and grow our middle class. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is failing, and worse, he's dividing Canadians. Yep. Like the St. John Mayor, the paper says the Liberals are leaving the East without key infrastructure, and quote, Energy East didn't need a buyout, it just needed Ottawa to make the case for it. Exactly. Actually, that's just like Trans Mountain, except the Liberals approved it with different rules. But quote, 
The interests of the Maritimes have been ignored. A shame that, with Energy East, it was the interest of the whole country scuttled by remarkable incompetence. Oh. When will the Prime Minister stop picking favourites in pipelines and provinces and champion Canadian energy for all? Yeah. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The reality is that the BC government has been intimidating a private company and a project that has been approved by both the federal and provincial governments. We will not be intimidated. This project is in the national interest and we are taking action to ensure that it is built for the benefits of all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Montmagny, Lille, Kamouraska, Rivière du Loup. Mr. Speaker, when the Liberals took office, there were four viable pipelines in the private sector, and now there is not a single one. How many other private committees, companies does the Prime Minister intend to sabotage and then nationalize them through the back door and make his father's dream come true? National Energy Program number two. The Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, what we are doing is to invest in protecting thousands of jobs in Alberta and across the country. Because of 10 years of rigid ideology on the part of the Conservatives, they weren't able to build pipelines to bring our resources elsewhere than to the United States. When the Prime Minister went to Fort McMurray and when he met with energy workers there, he told them that the government would have their backs. We are investing in Canadians who work hard. Mr. Speaker, um, my colleague opposite just said that private companies didn't see a business case for pipelines in Canada. They did during our government, when we didn't have a tanker ban, when we didn't put in place a carbon tax, when we weren't politically vetoing major projects that had already passed major environmental reviews. The reality is there is no business case in Canada for major resource projects because of this Prime yeah, Minister yeah. and his bad policies. Yeah, yeah. So will this member get up? There's no business case in Canada for private investment in the energy sector because of them. Yeah, yeah. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, the previous government spent 10 years pitting the environment and the economy against each other. They pitted us against each other. It polarized us. That is not who we are. The majority of Canadians support this project. The majority of Canadians understand that we are in a tr transition to a clean growth economy and that we will not get there overnight, but we will get there. This week is about providing Canadian families with certainty. No political interference should ever get in the way of that. Make no mistake, this isn't Canada's, this investment is in Canada's future. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Political interference that has occurred in the natural resource sectors under this government when they veto the Northern Gateway Pipeline. It's so rich for them to stay up this to talk about political polarization when we've got everybody in the country united around one thing. We shouldn't have had to spend $4.5 billion to send private investment outside of this country. This government needs to stand up and take accountability for the fact that they are chasing away investment from this country, they will do it for years to come. Why won't this government take responsibility for their failures? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We will take no lessons from the party opposite on how to get to support a pipeline and actually get one built. Let's be clear, Mr. Speaker. The permit for the Northern Gateway project was quashed by the court because of the absolute failure on the part of the Harper Conservative. Order, order, order. The Honourable Opposition House Leader has been talking throughout the answer. I'd ask her not to do that, and I'd ask all members on both sides not to speak when someone else has the floor. Order. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said, the permit for the Northern Gateway project was quashed in court because of the absolute failure on the part of the Harper Conservative Conservatives to appropriately consult Indigenous peoples. We will take our role in this process very seriously, and we will continue to work with Indigenous communities, municipalities, provinces and territories to ensure that good projects move forward and create good jobs. The Honourable Member for Abitibi, Bay James, Nunavik, EU. 
Mr. Speaker, yesterday was a remarkable day when my bill to ensure that the laws of Canada respect the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was passed. But yesterday I also asked the Prime Minister if his decision to impose a pipeline despite opposition on the part of First Nations upheld the honour of the Crown. And as you saw, Mr. Speaker, there was no answer. Is this government of the opinion that their approach to pipelines respects the letter and the spirit of the United Nations Declaration? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, the New Democrats saluted the environmental program of Rachel Motley's, but that plan also contained, allow me to remind them, a cap on greenhouse gas emissions from the oil sands, putting a price on pollution, a pipeline to bring resources to markets other than in the United States, and it also included many consultations with the Indigenous peoples. That is true leadership in terms of climate change. For Skeena Bulkley Valley. They spent so much money on a pipeline they can't afford new talking points. <laughs> yesterday was an historic day for Canada because yesterday we voted 206 to 79 to pass Bill C262 enshrining the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People into Canadian law. We must thank my friend from Abitibi Bay James EU for a lifetime of dedication fighting for the rights of Aboriginal people. Liberal government to put action behind their words and their vote. Will they respect UNDRIP and commit not to put a shovel into the ground on their new pipeline until after all the Aboriginal rights and title cases have been resolved? <laughs> that what we did was we took additional time and steps to review the process to make it more rigorous. We extended consultation to ensure we were meeting and indeed exceeding our duty to consult Indigenous peoples. That's something the Harper government failed to do. The permit for Northern Gateway, as I said, was quashed in court because of lack of consultation by the former Conservative government. As a project that was subject to the most exhaustive review of any pipeline in Canadian history, this pipeline will be built. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Member for Carleton. These Trump tariffs will be damaging on Canadian steel and aluminum producers. Almost as damaging as the Liberal tariffs that are being imposed on those very same Canadian companies in the form of carbon taxes and higher payroll taxes. Taxes that their competitors south of the border will not have to pay. In light of today's trade dispute, will the government exempt Canadian companies from these punitive taxes so that they can compete against their American counterparts? Honourable Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It seems the party opposite has learned nothing. The environment and the economy go together. We have been clear that we are going to tackle climate change. We're going to take serious action. We're going to put a price on pollution. We're phasing out coal. We're making historic investments in public transportation and green infrastructure and clean technology. There's a $23 trillion opportunity. Why doesn't the party opposite get with the program? The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, the Liberal program is to move jobs and industry out of this country to jurisdictions which have poorer environmental standards and where jobs will not come to Canadian workers. These taxes will impose higher costs on Canadian enterprises and Canadian workers, right at a time when they can least afford to face those kinds of costs. Will the government exempt Canadian businesses that are competing with fiercely with companies south of the border from these new taxes and protect Canadian jobs? Honourable Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud to stand up today wearing a hammer necklace in memory of my hometown. A hammer. We will stand up for Canadian jobs. We will stand up for steel workers and aluminum workers. And we will also do it while growing the economy. Once again, I wish the party opposite would understand that in the 21st century, the economy and the environment go hand in hand. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Order. Mr. Speaker, this government is hammering Canadian businesses with higher taxes and higher costs. Now, outside of Canada, 
companies won't have to pay these taxes. In fact, businesses will be able to set up shop and hire workers in competing jurisdictions without any of the burdens this Liberal government is imposing here at home. Today is the day, with all the events that are, that are before us now, for the government to announce that it will exempt Canadian businesses from these new taxes, stand up to jo Donald Trump and support Canadian jobs. Will they do that? Honourable Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, it is really disappointing that the party opposite would use this announcement by the, U the announcement by the U.S. administration to advance their own political agenda. Why don't they stand with us and stand with Canadian workers and stand up for what is right? That is exactly what we're doing. Stop politicizing this issue. Stand with Canadians. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Carleton. We are standing with Canadian workers. We're standing against the taxes that will kill jobs for Canadian workers. Now, this, this government, it continues to pile on one new tax after another, a carbon tax, higher payroll taxes, taxes on Canadian jobs. That, the only effect of that will be to drive industry to com competing jurisdictions like the United States of America. Why won't they stand up to Donald Trump Step back from these taxes and protect Canadian jobs. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance. Mr. And I'd like to remind the member opposite that 85% of Canadians already live in a jurisdiction where there is a price on carbon, but I can also tell him that 100% of small businesses will get a tax break, a tax reduction, by the, in the new budget going to 9%. That's the actions we're taking, Mr. Speaker, amongst many, to make sure we support Canadian businesses, create jobs, and we've created 600,000 jobs over the last two years, something they never could achieve in 10 years, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. Thank you. Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, a cabinet directive in effect since 1995 compels all ministers to complete and submit a sustainability assessment hmm. on any proposal to cabinet. The Liberals proudly claim their deep commitment to ensuring sustainability considerations for all their decisions, including impacts to environment and indigenous rights. So, did the finance minister comply with this directive hmm. and submit a sustainability assessment on his decision to buy the Kinder Morgan pipeline? If no, why not? If yes, will he publicly disclose it? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's be clear that the TMX expansion uh, included a full environmental assessment. We considered uh, all of the different factors involved, including the impacts on climate change. It fits within Alberta's hard cap on emissions. It fits within our climate plan. Yes, of course we look at the environmental impacts of all decisions we make. We also look at the jobs impact. We wish the party officer would do the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, in 2016, the Prime Minister said that while governments grant permits for resource development, only communities grant permission. Vancouver, yeah. Burnaby, the Squamish, the tsleil the Coldwater Nations, and many others along the Kinder Morgan route have said no. That's right. But this government has taken direct ownership for driving this pipeline straight through these communities. What does the Prime Minister plan to do when tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of citizens demonstrate and hold him to account for his flawed pipeline and broken promise? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The safety and security of, public and of the public and energy infrastructure is a priority for this government. Unlike the Harper Conservatives who labelled environmental groups foreign-funded radicals, we accept a diversity of views and opinions. But we expect people to express their views peacefully and in accordance with the law. We recognize that not everyone agrees with those decisions, but we re remain committed to working to ensure a strong economy while taking leadership on the environment. Our goal now is to ensure that this project moves forward to create economic benefits for all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Ab, Deputy Avignon, the Honourable Member for Avignon, Avignon Mr. Mr. Speaker, contrary to the Conservatives' rhetoric, all the people on this side of the House are very proud of our Prime Minister to bring in concrete measures to defend the interests of Canadians and Canadian business. Mr. Speaker, 
ordre d'idée d'un bout à l'autre de notre pays, nous, nos chercheurs Canada de renommée mondiale inspirent de nouvelles connaissances ainsi que de nouvelles générations de scientifiques. Et ça va nous faire des investissements historiques en infrastructure, en recherche et en science, parce que la ministre des Sciences est élaborée sur les... Can the Minister of Science... Alors... Alors... Order, please. Thanks for the help, but no thanks. Thank you. Level Minister of Science. I'd like to thank the member for supporting soar to new heights. They need support. This is why we've launched an investment, the largest investment in research in Canada's history. $158 million investment. This in partnership with those acknowledged people across Canada and will build a healthier, stronger, and more prosperous country. The Honourable Member for Charbourg, Autain Char, Mr. Speaker, Canadians are unanimous. Canada should not reward strangers who enter our country illegally. The Quebec Liberal government said clearly, the Liberal government here in Ottawa, that it's overrun with illegal migrants and it can't deal with it anymore. Yesterday we learned that the Liberal, Liberal government of Ontario, under the pretext of an election, is refusing to accept other illegal migrants. So the these two great provinces are overwhelmed. What is the plan of the minister to deal with this crisis? Mr. Speaker, I don't at all agree with what my colleague said or the terms he used. We're working constructively with the province of Quebec and the province of Ontario on the issue of asylum seekers. We had another meeting last night. Quebec is open to asylum seekers. As Canada is, as long as the rules are followed when someone uh, seeks asylum. The Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, I would remind the Minister that Quebec said that it was waiting for the triage plan. You know, the Liberals, no one can compare with them when it comes to hypocrisy. The Minister of Immigration says that illegal migrants are not welcome, but the Minister of Transport says that there's a process in place for illegal migrants who want to settle in Ontario. The Minister went to Nigeria, but he didn't deem it appropriate to go to visit saint bernard de la Car to see the magnitude of the problem. The Minister must understand the problems here in Canada. Will the Immigration Minister visit Quebec or is he afraid to visit the Quebec province, the Honourable Minister? We are working constantly on this problem and I do not agree with my colleague when he says that we should work on this issue in Canada alone. We have implemented a plan of awareness raising in the United States to deal with the diaspora who can help us and also most of the people who cross at Lagarde like I come from Nigeria, so our minister's visit to Nigeria was extremely important and has borne fruit. Thank you. Here are the facts. The Liberals expro expropriated 25% of a fishing quota from a company and gave it to the, Liberal, the brother of a Liberal MP and a former Liberal MP. They claimed it was for reconciliation, but now they're being sued by a First Nation. Wow. The company they awarded the quota to doesn't even have a boat, so they won't be able to harvest the expropriated quota. So, no reconciliation, no harvesting, no jobs. Will the Prime Minister do the right thing and reverse this unethical expropriation? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries. Mr. Speaker, our decision to introduce Indigenous participation is consistent with our government's commitment to developing a renewed relationship between Canada and Indigenous peoples. The Minister made this decision to allow for increased Indigenous participation in the fishery, and we reject any claim to the contrary in the strongest of terms. Our government is proud of this decision and will continue to focus on how it will directly benefit the people of Atlantic Canada and Quebec. The Honourable Member for North Okanagan, Shushwa. Mr. Speaker, contrary to Liberal claims, the, our Conservative government initiated a process to include First Nations, and I can send that press release to the member if he wishes. It would increase the total allowable catch, allowing new entrants without stealing it away from another existing holder. The Minister has made such a botchery and ethical mess of this deal and put at risk the people and jobs in Grand Bank, Newfoundland. Can the Minister confirm that his lucky winner won't even be able to harvest their quota this year? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
As I've stated in this house many times, Mr. Speaker, these claims are completely unsubstantiated, and the fact that there's a new participant in the surf clam industry uh, should not be a surprise. As the member just stated, they went through a similar process. The only difference, both in fact and opinion, is that they didn't include Indigenous people when they went through their process. We're proud of our robust process that allowed us to pick the best expression of interest to ensure that the highest number of Atlantic Canadians and people from Quebec benefited from this decision. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Longueuil, Saint Hubert. Mr. Speaker, the CRTC's report on the future of our culture is clear. The system has to be fair. And we were right. The Netflix agreements and the GST breaks are ridiculous. I'm going to quote the title of one of the briefs submitted to the CRTC. Here it is. We don't need reports. We need concrete action. Now, that title is not made up. Everyone's asking for the same thing. Will the minister finally start moving forward? Please, the Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank the chair of the CRTC and his team for all the work that they put into this study, this report. Ultimately, our objective is to protect our culture in the 21st century. The Minister of Innovation and myself will be dealing with changes to the Telecommunications Act. The Harper Conservatives make drastic cuts to culture. We will act and we will go forward. The Honourable Member for Saint-Hyacinthe, Mr. Speaker, seasonal workers are at the end of their tether. To such a point that Acadians are meeting in the church at the night to pray for the seasonal workers who can't manage to feed their families. Everyone agrees that the Liberals have improvised on this file and that what these workers need is not a miracle. Rather than training, they need concrete solutions, permanent solutions to deal with the EI black hole. Will the Prime Minister finally honour their promises? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for giving me the opportunity to talk about this very important subject, as she knows well. In the 2018 budget, for the first time in the history of the country, we show just how much the Canadian government is already in contact and aware of the action needed to support these workers, their families, and businesses. She also knows that over the next months and over the next years, there will be a historic um, investment of $2.3 billion. The Honourable Member for Paris, Jacques Mr. Speaker, it seems that the Liberals are very nervous. Canadians are beginning to realize the disaster they're inflicting on our country. They're starting to panic. This is an Here's another way to try to stifle other political parties. They are much touted democratic reform. They want to limit spending by political parties before the writ is dropped. What's the problem? Will the rules be the same for the government? Will they limit announcements and spending by their ministers during that same period? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. As you know, we have introduced to C-76 in order to improve democracy so that Canadians can, more Canadians can vote because in the last election there were a lot of Canadians who could not vote. We also want to help train uh, young people to become future electors. Hello. Hello. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Banff Airdrie. Well, Mr. Speaker, we all know that Liberals love to spend money that isn't theirs. And the Liberal government routinely spends millions of dollars in ridings where by-elections are being called, trying to buy their way out of trouble. And that money belongs to Canadian taxpayers and not to the Liberal Party. So meanwhile, the Prime Minister is trying to restrict the opposition parties in spending their own money to speak to Canadians. But he won't ban ministerial travel or advertising in that pre-election period because he, that will give the Liberals an advantage. So when will the Prime Minister stop using taxpayers' money to try to buy elections for the Liberal Party? Honourable Minister of Democratic Institutions. 
Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I told my honourable colleague in committee, the, the project, Z, uh, the <laughs> legislation C-76 does not limit travel at all. But when he's talking about advertising, it doesn't for any party during the period. It's only with regards to advertising. But perhaps he's thinking about, I don't know, a previous Conservative minister who perhaps put a CPC logo when he was delivering Canada child benefit checks. But let's see, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're doing this, because Canadians want to ensure integrity in our electoral system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable... The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Mr. Speaker, today this House is debating the 2018 budget, which imposes a massive carbon tax on Canadians. Shame. Now, other ministers have agreed to appear before committees to defend their spending plans. Sadly, despite repeated requests, the Environment Minister won't publicly Shame. say whether Shame. she will come to committee to defend her harmful carbon tax. Mr. Spe Speaker, the buck stops Apologize. with the Minister. Canadians are demanding to know, will she publicly defend her carbon tax plan before we have to vote on it? Will she answer, and is it yes or no? Minister of Environment. I've appeared before a committee many, many times on issues unrelated to carbon pricing, and the question always for the party opposite is on carbon pricing. Every day in the House, I defend putting a price on pollution. And let's be clear, 80 percent of Canadians live in a province that's actually stepped up and said we need to take action on climate change. Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec put a price on pollution. They're tackling climate change, and guess what? Their economies are the fastest that's growing right. in the country. That's right. that's See, we want to see more jobs, less emission, tackle climate change. We owe it to our kids. Honourable Member for Toronto Danforth. Mr. Speaker, the sun is out and Canadians are turning their minds to summer travel. There's no better place to travel than across our country from coast to coast to coast. And many people will be including in their plans a trip to Ottawa to celebrate Canada Day. Can the Minister of Canadian Heritage Please update this House on the planning for July 1st. Yeah. Honourable Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague from Toronto, Don Ford, for her, the question. Canada Day is a time where Canadians of all age can take part in a wide range of activities that celebrate our communities. This year, we'll be showcasing the important contributions that have fashioned and built our, our country. There will be all kinds of stars featured for July 1st. I look forward to all Canadians from coast to coast to come to come on Parliament Hill for July 1st and celebrate Canada Day all together. We know that the Prime Minister is eager to have the whole world discover my beautiful riding at the G7 summit, but we also know that these events sometimes have demonstrators and vandalism. Although everyone laments this kind of violence, I would hope that the, the Prime Minister does not ignore the fact that it exists and will make sure that he assumes his responsibilities and reassures my, uh, the citizens in my riding. So the Prime Minister, can you tell us that the government has a special compensation fund for citizens who fall victim to vandalism? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, arrangements are, uh, are firmly in place uh, to deal with uh, all eventualities around the, uh, the G7 uh, summit. Uh, obviously, meetings of the G7 are extremely important uh, to the participants, but also uh, to many other countries around the world. Security is important. That is the responsibility of the host country. The arrangements have been put in place. The opposition parties have been briefed. Uh, and Canadians can count on the excellent professionalism of their police and security services. Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. The shortfall for clean water for First Nations on reserve is $3.2 billion. The shortfall in housing much more severe. So this week, when I was dealing with a young mother with a chronically sick child living in a mold-infested shack, what am I to tell her, that she's now part owner of a 65-year-old pipeline, mm -hmm. or that it's not Doug Ford who's going to drive the first bulldozer through First Nation territory? It's going to be this Prime Minister. So why is it that with First Nation children, change is always incremental, but Texas oil investors, they get what they want, when they want it, from this Prime Minister? Excellent. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Business Services.
Mr. Speaker, yesterday in this House, we all agreed together, or at least most of the parties agreed, that we respect the rights of Indigenous peoples. And our government has embarked on a new relationship with Indigenous peoples, and we are making the appropriate investments. To date, $17 billion in the last three budgets, 13,000 homes being built across this country, 62 clean water drinking water advisories have been lifted across the country, new investments in schools, health care, infrastructure. We are getting the work done. Honourable member for Scarborough Guildwood. Mr. Speaker, for the sixth time, Bill Browder was arrested under an Interpol arrest warrant. Mr. Browder has been tireless in his advocacy of Magnitsky legislation. To retaliate, Russia has added him to the Interpol a warrant arrest list. Could the Minister of Public Safety speak to what the Government of Canada is doing to ensure that individuals such as Mr. Browder, unjustly a, a, a blacklisted by Russia, will not be unlawfully detained if they come to Canada? Yeah, okay. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Speaker, uh, last fall I condemned Russia's abuse of the Interpol notice system to try to block Bill Browder from visiting Canada to celebrate the passage of Canada's Magnitsky Act. As I said then, quote, Canada will decide admissibility to Canada, not the Kremlin. Interpol notices are a valuable tool that should not be perverted for other purposes like foreign political interference. When Mr. Browder was in Canada earlier this year, he was welcomed and celebrated as a human rights champion, including by all sides in this House, and I'm sure that will continue. The Honourable Member for Lady Lapinière. Mr. Speaker, with the Liberals, we know that everything is allowed as long as they don't get caught. I have criticized over and over the conflict of interest concerning the trips of the Prime Minister with his family to the Arikans Island. But here the media are reporting this morning a memo on the meetings between PMO and the Arga Khan, almost entirely redacted. That's liberal transparency for you. Mr. Speaker, if transparency is so important at PMO, why are 251 out of 316 pages blocked out? What are they hiding? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Yes, sir, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I can, assure the, I can assure the member that at the end of the day, we have a Prime Minister that is committed to working with the Ethics Commissioner in full cooperation that has been illustrated on numerous uh, occasions. We on this side of the House have full confidence in our independent offices, whether it's the Commissioners, whether it's the Elections Canada. This is important in terms of our parliamentary traditions and history, and we support that. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord, Mr. Speaker, on 26 April, the Canadian press reported that the plan for triage for uh, asylum seekers is, was supposed to have taken place in a few days. That it ended up taking a few weeks and then a few months later. The minister, is the minister aware that he's ragging the park while we'll co the people are continuing crossing Roxham Road? Mr. Speaker, as you know, we're working in close collaboration with the province of Quebec and the province of Ontario on triage because we know that many asylum seekers want to settle in Ontario. We're working closely with officials in the Immigration Department in Ontario, and we've made enormous progress, but we have to wait for the new Ontario government to finalize arrangements. The Honourable Member for the village, no. Well, Mr. Speaker, they keep talking, and in the meantime, this plan has been delayed because of elections. So does this mean that asylum seekers are going to stop crossing the border because there is a, an election in Ontario or because there's an election in Quebec? Wait, no, it's no triage because of uh, the Saint-Jean-Baptiste. 
The Honourable Minister of Transport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague may not understand that a triage plan is not just asking people, do you want to turn left or right? It's a little more. There's a little more to it than that. We have to take a commitment, make a commitment with Ontario to not only get these people transported, but to have them uh, received and accommodated. This is something very complex. We have to deal with reality, and I can uh, guarantee that we won't stop working on the 24th of June. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, yesterday President Trump decided to impose uh, tariffs of 25% on aluminum. Canada has never been able to regain uh, a position of strength with the United States. It is the sectors of the economy in Quebec. There are significant sectors that are being assaulted from all sides. Can the Prime Minister admit that his strategy is a failure and that it will have disastrous consequences for the economy of Quebec. The Minister of Transport, well, I don't agree what the United States will do, what it will do with its tariffs. We're there for workers in the aluminum industry and the steel industry. We were very clear in the measures we intend to take in coming weeks with respect to the United States. We're there for the workers of Quebec. We're there for the workers of Canada. We will not accept the premise that the United States have uh, used us to impose their tariffs. I would like to draw to the attention of honourable members the presence in the gallery of this year's recipients of the Governor General's Performing Arts Awards. First, the recipients of the Lifetime Artistic Achievement Award, Andrew Alexander, Jean-Viev 